on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. Stories are absolutely key. If you want people to retain information, you have to tell stories. You need the facts in there. You can you can back up your story with facts, but you've got to start with the story. You've got to start with emotional, you know, human connection, and you've got to make it real to people because if you don't, they're just not going to they're not going to listen. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. This is The Self-Publishing Show with James Blatch. And Mark Dawson. Hello, Mark. I'm uh, slightly embarrassed about my hair now. I'm getting to the point where I'm going to have to submit myself to my daughter again. For some what? sort of uh, terrifying uh, experience with scissors. Um, <laughs> that sounded, yeah. it sounded bad and then it got worse. Yeah. But uh, it's only when I look at myself uh, here, I realise how bad it is. Um, okay, look, before we do anything else, let's say hello to some Patreon supporters, people who've gone along to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show and become a part of our show, become part of our family by pledging as little as a dollar an episode. You get a shout out for that. You get access to the university. You get all sorts of things you can check out on our Patreon page. So thank you very much indeed to Val Andrews, Chad Sines and Joseph John. They are our three new Patreon supporters this week. Thank you very much indeed. We're recording this on Monday, the 20-something of Second. 22nd of June. To go out Friday later this week, uh, we would have closed up ads for authors for another year. Well, not a year, but uh, probably the rest of this year. Uh, and we had uh, tremendous interest. We coincided some webinars with the opening of the course, uh, but also gave an opportunity for people not just either who are either already in the course or, or not going to buy the course, but to get some of uh, the knowledge that we're accumulating from Janet Margot. And we have Facebook Live Q and A's and two webinars that had a thousand people in attendance, which is incredible. Not Margot. Not Margot. I did call her Margot once. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think I've done that before as well. Yeah, no, it was it was very popular. Yeah, we we did it was it was good. Um, yeah, I think eight thousand people registered over the two. So some of those would have registered for more than one. Um, but you know, fair enough. Plus, we did one with China Pen, which was really good. So we knew it'd be busy. Um, and yeah. uh, and it was so. And I'm I'm hearing lots of good things in the in the community and also outside it as well from people who got good uh, value from those two webinars. But I just think what a great sign it as the vibrance and life that's in the self-publishing community at the moment a thousand people on a webinar there aren't many industries that produce those kind of figures uh, and our one does so that's um not only because we put on a good webinar mark but uh, because people are ready to learn want to move forward and there's a sensing a, an opportunity and we've talked about this before we'll talk about it again self-publishing is an opportunity it certainly is yeah no, it's um it's I actually emailed out as as we record this. It's kind of not quite the end of the course. So I sent an email out this afternoon. I'm just really setting out the fact that uh, although lots of industries have suffered during uh, lockdown, publishing doesn't necessarily have to be one. So some parts of publishing certainly are suffering, but not. I don't think indies are in that situation. Um, we've spoken about that before, but it's um, yeah. you know, I've I've had three really strong months. Um, you know, obviously. That's great. Now there's lots of more important things um, going on uh, as opposed to just selling books. But it, if you if you're going to be you've got to put the food on the table, it's not a bad position to be in right now for us. And if you want some black and white facts to back up the the uh, the point that Mark made, has made, it, this is not necessarily a bad time for publishing. Uh, you could do worse than to trip over to the published drive blog. They published a couple actually. I mentioned meant, meant to mention them before on the podcast. Uh, they published a couple during the COVID crisis, looking at the effect on publishing. And in both cases, they found through their own data that there's been an uptake in all sorts of areas: uh, foreign book sales, international, as in non-US book sales of eBooks in particular, going up outside the normal territories. And I think a few people have noticed that. You said to me, Mark, actually, uh, a week or so ago, start selling in Australia because you'd notice a little uptake there. Uh, and things are definitely mm. happening during this period. So it's been good. Uh, one other. Go on. You're going to say something? No, just um, speaking about book selling, I just got an email just before we came. We started doing this from my agent saying, uh, Dear blank, um, <laughs> we are publishing house from North Macedonia. We want to buy copyright for a book, The Dragon and the Ghost from Mark Dawson. 
Um, I have to say, my my radar kind of this is a terrible segue, but my, and it's off a bit of a tangent. But my radar was um, immediately alerted, given that I had a very a similar approach from well, not hopefully not similar, but I had an approach from um, a, a magazine called New Reader Magazine, which I posted into the uh, Facebook mm. group uh, over the weekend. Offering me um, the the of the amazing opportunity to spend ten thousand dollars to get a guaranteed book, a film made out of my book with uh, and it was that book as well. Um, so I was slightly um, I'm slightly uh, suspicious, I suppose. Mm. But anyway, they they do appear to be um, kosher, mm. even though I, I can't help reading that and not thinking of uh, Borat reading it to me. Yes, <laughs> which is stereotyping. Stereotyping is never not funny. Um, okay, look, uh, one more thing just to mention is that uh, you may know that Mark and I have a, an imprint called Fuse Books. We publish at the moment the books of Robert Story, aptly named. Uh, Robert, who passed away last year, and we're very happy to be um, publishing his books and bringing them to new authors and new readers, I should say. Yeah, there is an opportunity actually with this because uh, Robert left extensive notes for the follow-up books, uh, about 80 pages worth actually, and we are now starting the process of looking for a ghostwriter um, to fill that uh, void left by Robert and, and complete the series. Um, so we want somebody who obviously is a good writer, as a first and foremost. Secondly, I think writing in genre. And the genre is a difficult one to actually nail down. It's somewhere between sort of action and adventure and sci-fi. So think of Indiana Jones, maybe with a little bit of uh, background story that might be slightly out of this world, which actually, yeah, that is Indiana Jones, isn't it? Of course, he always had a bit of that going on. Um, but a bit more serious, a bit more po politics-like than Indiana Jones. And the books have a very loyal following. I get emails from readers now, and many of whom are looking for the follow-up books. So we're just starting the trawl. If you want to know any more about that, go to our community Facebook group, and you'll find a post from Mark in there. Just uh, drop me an email, and we'll, uh, we'll start discussions. We'll start looking. Right. Do we have anything else to mention, Mark, before we come to this week's, ep uh, this week's interview? No, I don't think we do. So do you know who Vicky Fraser is? Well done for putting me on the spot. No, I, actually, I don't. But then I don't know everybody in our community. Um, no, I've done it. I have done it deliberately because the reason that Vicky is on the on on the podcast is because she was very clever in attracting your attention. Oh, does that, right. Does that ring a bell? She sent you a package. She. Oh, right. Okay. Yes, that was very clever. Yes, I do remember who it was. Yeah, if it's who I think it was, she sent me. Um, a package of goodies. Um, I think probably to my agent's address. Well, my accountant's address, I suspect, um, including a very nice handwritten note um, and some some things that might quite taste quite nice. Um, and yeah, I mean, normally um, I get I get quite a few people pitching bits and bobs to me like that. And normally I don't have time to read them. They just if I don't know who they are, they kind of go straight in the bin, virtual bin or otherwise. Um, but yeah, this one this one certainly um, got my attention because she'd gone to a lot of effort um, and it was personalised. Um, she she'd thought about what might stop me from binning it and it worked um so you know i'm quite jaded and she managed to to get past my defenses so i thought yeah why not let's see what she has to say your level of cynicism so yes yeah, so mm. that's how vicky got herself onto the podcast please don't send us shoe boxes of uh, of goodies that's already been done you can't you have to think of something better uh, next time money uh, but actually yes money <laughs> of course we're completely corrupt um actually it was a really valuable and well worth uh, doing the interview and that's why it's being broadcast we necessarily broadcast every interview we record uh, and Vicky works primarily in non-fiction she is definitely somebody who is enthusiastic about life and about this particular career making it happen and uh, not just for non-fiction but for fiction writers as well I think we're going to glean a lot from uh, realizing your dream here's Vicky this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer Vicky, welcome to the self-publishing show. Lovely to have you on there. It's very difficult to start any conversation at the moment without referencing the fact that we are recording this in the middle of the pandemic. Well, probably, unfortunately, not in the middle of the pandemic, but in the, on the upslope at the moment. So yeah. that's very much in our minds. And we'll perhaps have a little chat about business interruption and how people cope with that, because I think it might be relevant for some time yet. But our main topic really is about non-fiction books. And actually, funny enough, something that came up in an interview I recorded not that long ago, I've been doing a lot of interviews recently, so I can't tell you who it was, but we talked about the importance of, te importance of telling a story in non-fiction. 
yeah. uh, as well as it being a fiction thing. And I know this is a big area for you. So I think that's a great, a great place for us to, to, uh, to dwell on. But let's hear a little bit about you, Vicky. You had to tell us about yourself. Um, well, yeah, thank you for having me on the show. This is really exciting. Um, and I don't know, where do you want me to start? I, I've, I've had quite a varied career. I started off as a scenes of crime officer. <laughs> Did I you? know, right? Soccer. Yeah, oh, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. I used to love those people. They used to turn up in all their white. Well, actually, if you've still got some of those um, white suits you used to wear, they're probably quite useful now. I, don't, I sadly don't that was a long long time yeah. ago um went from there to marketing for a charity didn't know anything about marketing they taught me a lot um did a couple of other jobs after the charity um and then got to utter the immortal word you can't fire me because I quit um oh. and <laughs> found myself uh in my car, sobbing to my husband, being like, oh my God, I don't know what to do now. And then one of the agencies that I had worked with at the, I call it the job from hell, that was the, the one that I left um, under a cloud. Um, they, yeah, one of the agencies gave me a ring and said, do you fancy some freelance work? And that was me off. I thought, well, I've always wanted to run my own business. This is the perfect time. I've always wanted to write for a living. So, um, so yeah, that's what I did. And ever since then, I've been writing for a living and teaching other people how to do it. And I think you were copywriting in those early days. Yeah, I started off as a copywriter Um, very quickly realized I didn't know anything about copywriting just because you can write doesn't mean that you can sell. Um, so spent a lot of time learning how to sell um, how to write persuasively. Um, yeah, did a lot of studying and eventually one of my clients asked me to write a book for them. And that's kind of how that started. Um, I okay. thought, OK, I'll have a go at that. And that's what I do now. Well, let's talk about just dwell on the copywriting. So it was obviously your introduction into it and then then the book. Um, so, I, I mean, I used to write short news stories. I used to be a news journalist. I kind of know that bit of it. But I'm always a bit fascinated by copywriters. I mean, do you sit there and Procter and Gamble contact you and say, can you write what goes on the side of our washing up liquid bottle, please? Is it that sort of job? Um, for some copywriters, yeah, it's, it's kind of that sort of job. Um, there's also there's loads of different types of copywriting, actually. Um, there's a lot of people call content writing copywriting. It can be. I, I think all writing should have a call to action at the end. Um, so I think all writing should be direct response copywriting, um, you know, one way or another. But then there's product descriptions. There's, um, you know, there's social media posts. There's all sorts of different types of copywriting. And it is a really, it's a fascinating and very career. I've learned an awful lot about a lot of different things doing yeah. what I used to do it, it it can be very cool it can also be quite stressful <laughs> like anything I guess yeah well you had deadlines and fussy clients yeah yeah clients who who think well you know I can I can write everyone can write so you know why 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 do I need to pay a copywriter to do this this kind of writing because you know we're all taught to write at school so yes um so there's if people don't if people don't understand what the difference is between just writing and writing to sell um it's it's really psychology which is why i think it's such a fascinating topic and why all writers fiction or non-fiction should know at least the basics of copywriting because it's about getting into people's heads and figuring out what makes them tick mm. what makes them want to buy what makes them want to do anything uh, and you've got to understand that if you want people to do what you want them to do well i guess it should lend itself to being a good blurb writer if you've spent a bit of time honing your short sentence you know they're getting inside people's heads to write short uh say you know sales sentences but okay well let's move on to the book then so you got asked by a client to write a, a i guess a long form book much longer than the sort of copywriting jobs you were doing yeah so the client was actually a recycling they, they recycled um ink cartridges printer ink cartridges and they wanted to produce a piece of marketing collateral um to help them stand out from their competitors because nobody else in the market was writing books. Hard, hardly any business owners write books, really. Um, and it, it's a good thing to do. So they had decided they wanted a book that would help their potential clients and clients decide who to use to, you know, who to who to pick to do their recycling. And also why recycling print cartridges was a good idea, because it's certainly back then when, when I did that work for them. Um, there was a lot of misinformation being put about by the like, well, by the likes of Brother and, you know, the big printer people um, about what you could and couldn't use in the printers and a oh, lot yeah. of propri proprietary software, that kind of thing. And so they wanted to put out the, they, they just wanted to educate people about how you can be more kind to the environment and, you know, save a lot of money and still not compromise on quality for print cartridges and things. So as part of that, um, we, we wrote a book. Uh, that was the very first one that I wrote. It's, <laughs> I look back on it kind of fondly and, and, you know, thinking, gosh, I've come a long way since then. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really good fun. That was the first one I wrote. Is there a whole book in that subject? Yeah, 
you wouldn't think there would be with you because they were talking about that's the thing because you don't just talk about um the the thing itself it's like, like I get a lot of people a lot of business owners say well you know how much can I actually write about tires or you know me mechanics or matches or whatever it is that they're, they're kind of selling but it's not just about that so they wanted to talk about all of the implications of um we which is the the kind of electrical recycling regulations okay um the yeah, I can't, I can't remember what they all stand for now. It's so long ago. But there was a lot that you can talk about around recycling and the recycling of electrical stuff and the regulations and what businesses could do to help to help their clients to be more environmentally friendly, to save money, all of that kind of thing. So there's a lot to talk about. It wasn't just printer cartridges, but the end result was, oh, wow, these guys really know what they're talking about. They're good people. They're a good company. They're trying to do something bigger than, than them. They're the ones that we're going to go to for our printer cartridges and to make sure that, you know, that we, we can be as green as possible so it was in very much the way that we look at non-fiction authors in this area it the book was a, a a lead magnet to get people to get visibility and get them in onto their main list etc but also to establish their expertise yeah it was and over and above that since since then um i've come to realize that what i want to help business owners do is because there's a lot, there's a lot of books in a box out there. I don't, I don't know how much of the the nonfiction writing world world you. What does you've books seen. in a box mean? So you can kind of buy a blueprint or a formula to create a book with a template. Which and you know, I'm not knocking people to do that. That's fine. You know, go do what you want to do. But I think that books are incredibly important. Incredibly, I love books. I love them. Um, much like everybody listening to this podcast, you know, they're the the repository of human knowledge. They're the gateway to a different world and that's as true for non-fiction as it is for fiction in my mind and so I think that yes there is a lot to be said for creating a book that's a lead magnet and a book that is um you know a, a big business card I'm, I don't want my clients books to be just a glorified business card I think they have the potential to be so much more than that you know you can I think a lot of business owners think oh if I put too much in my book then nobody's going to buy my products and that's just not true I think that a book has the pretend you can tell people everything they want to know in the book and they will still come to you for your product because um you know think of all the people how many people actually do the thing that you want them to do from a book they'll read it the number of times people have read a book of mine and then come back to me and said oh your book was brilliant now how do I do this and I'm like I told you in my book but what they want is for someone to help them do it or for someone to do it for them okay now you talked um in your notes before the interview about habits this is an, uh, and I'd imagine at the moment with the disruption to people's lives, they are thinking about how to be in the habit of writing and so on. T t tell me your theory on, on writing habits. Make it as easy as possible. This is, this is, this is one of my theories. Um, I'm a massive fan of James Clear. I don't know if you've heard of James Clear. He wrote Atomic Habits. Okay. So that's my book recommendation for absolutely everybody listening to this podcast is read Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's brilliant. Um, but yeah, his, one of the key things that I took away from his book was make it really, really easy to uh, to write, basically take away the friction. So I can give you an example, not from not from the writing world. Um, if I, I'm learning to play the guitar, I play very, very badly uh, <laughs> and I didn't practice enough. And I was like, why am I so bad? It's like because you don't practice. Um, as soon as I brought the guitar into my office instead of into the house it became a little bit easier. And then when I took it out of its case and put it on a guitar stand, so I can now, I'm looking at it right now um, and it's glaring at me and it's saying, pick me up and play me. It's much easier for me to do that than it is for me to walk to the house, take it out of the thing, you know, start playing it, figure out. You can do exactly the same with writing. So if you if you know that you're gonna be writing your book, say for a couple of hours in the morning, then get everything set up the night before. Get your, you know, get your mug ready with your with everything you need so that you can walk into your, writing space with your with your mug with your notes ready don't be you know if you, if you want to be writing don't be having to do a load of research just before you want to start writing have it all done have it all done the night before have research time that's separate from writing time um have your equipment all ready make sure that you're not going to be interrupted put your phone on silent and preferably in a different room that was one of my most that was one of my most um important changes was to not have my phone in the same room with me because even when it's switched off it kind of calls to me mm. um so yeah there's there's so many things that you can do with habits but I think the thing yeah the thing that I would say is just make it as easy as possible and make it fun as well so you know if, if you're if you're thinking oh I've got to do something I'm not really looking forward to it very much ease into it with something that you are going to enjoy writing about so if you've got a scene to write you know whether you're writing fiction or non-fiction if you've got a scene or a chapter or a piece to write that you're thinking oh this is going to be a bit difficult 
start off with a fun bit instead and then ease into the bit that's that's not so fun because once you I found that once you start writing you don't want to if you can get into the groove you don't want to stop it's that it's that getting started it's that first couple of minutes I'm sure you found the same thing yeah yeah no definitely and um I think that's all good advice and it it is easy I think particularly and I'm probably representative of people who have a full-time job and write yeah, it sounds a bit weird but I you know although I work for myself I basically do lots of other things and writing is is on the back burner it is easy for it to be another chore in your list yeah and that's yeah. not the right way to write I mean either, either type of book but particularly I think probably an, an a fiction book that's there to entertain people is not to see it as a chore on your day yeah. but to try and as you say find the bits that you enjoy yeah and you know it's not always going to be fun I'm not saying that it's always going to be fun sometimes you're just going to be like oh this is just rubbish and there's not much you can do about that um but yeah certainly for people who are running a business as well and I think in I mean you know like you said we're going through weird times at the moment there has yeah. literally never been a better time to write a book of any kind um but if you are also running a business then um you, you've got to make and you really want to write a book you have to carve time out for it don't think that you're going to fit it in as and when, because I've never found that to be a successful a successful way to write um, a business book. Certainly, it's like carve out that time and treat it as if you would treat your most important client. Because if this is important to you, and it should be if you're going to do it, and you know it can be, you know writing books has changed my business. It's changed my clients' businesses. It can change your business too. Then it, make it important. You know, make sure that you know it's important. Treat it as if it's a client. Book it into your calendar and don't allow anything to eat into that time. Yeah. Good advice. Um, okay, well, let's talk about this this narrative in a non-fiction book. Now, I do think that um, uh, perhaps outside of our world, and maybe all the fiction writers or a lot of fiction writers would be in this group, don't really think of non-fiction books as being storybooks. They think of them as being maybe encyclopedias or manuals or something like that. But the more I think about this, and I think these are the examples I came up with in the chat the other day about. And the more I think about some of the most amazing nonfiction books I've read, the key ingredient was they told stories. Yes. So political biographies, which I quite like, historic biographies. Um, Darva Sobel, who wrote a fantastic book on, on um, longitude, on the discovery of um, uh, you know, Harrison, who made the watch. Now, that's a story about a Yorkshireman building watches and being ignored by London which could be written in all sorts of ways, but she made it the most, it was basically like reading a novel. That's the best nonfiction books, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, by the way, is one of my favorite books ever. I've read is it so it? many times. It's a, brilliant, it's a brilliant book. It's a great example of, of this being done well. My other one example is Claire Tomalin's Samuel Pepys book, the Pepys biography, which I think is absolutely on a par with Darva Sobel's, if you get a chance to read that one. The... That's going on my list. I have not read that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. There is there is no excuse for a nonfiction book to be boring. And and too many of them are. Um, and this goes for textbooks as well. It's like I, I've heard I've heard people people give advice that, oh, you know, if, if you're writing a textbook, then it's going to be a bit academic. And actually, I would argue that it's equally, if not more important for textbooks to be really interesting as well and to be enjoyable. And you know, the, the way we learn is through stories. We're told right from right from the moment, you know, we're like from the moment we're born that our parents are telling us stories about what the world is like we are hearing stories about what the world is like we are taught how to interact with other people through story we are taught about you know what what's what's socially acceptable and what isn't socially acceptable because of stories because of fairy tales but you know fairy tales were cautionary tales that's what they were originally yeah they were to, you know they were they were put there to to warn us not to i don't know not to talk to old you know old grandmothers i don't, I don't. <laughs> well, strange men with pipes and that sort of thing strange men with pipes that kind of thing yeah, yeah. yeah. um yeah and if you if actually if you go back and read the original um fairy tales they're quite brutal um they're quite, yes quite scary oh things. yeah they're sinister really sinister yeah um but yeah stories are absolutely key if you want people to retain information you have to tell stories you have to because if if you if you're just giving facts facts i mean there's an old saying in, in um sales facts tell stories sell um absolutely true yeah you, you need the facts in there you can you can back up your story with facts but you've got to start with the story you've got to start with emotional you know human connection and you've got to make it real to people because if you don't they're just not gonna they're not gonna listen yeah and I can I can certainly tell the difference I read too much non-fiction I'm supposed to be reading fiction novels you know, novels all the time because I'm trying to write one um, but I get drawn to non-fiction a lot and I'm quite a I mean, I can tell straight away a book, particularly the areas I'm interested in, like the Apollo Project, the sort of space program, books that are 
you know, full of facts and literal descriptions of what happened and the books that tell the story, they're starkly different. And one of them, one of them makes the first method makes it entirely forgettable unless maybe you're a certain type of mind that just retains facts. Um, but for everybody else, which is the vast majority of people, it is that story that that gets it home to you. There's a moment in the Titanic film, isn't there? Where they, you know, they say, I know, I, I, know, I know it's a bit of a, um, a divide of the Titanic film, but, you know, I, was a, I liked it like a lot of people did, most of the world, where he says... I, I, have, I, I have a confession to make because I have no, I've never seen You've never Titanic. seen Titanic, okay. <laughs> well, I can tell you for the... You must be one of the four people on the planet who's never seen I it. I know, but, I know. But um, there's a moment in that where everybody knows the Titanic story, and but this old woman on the boat tells them her story from that night. And at the end of it, they're all in tears and they sort of say they got it for the first time they understood what happened so you can know everything you want to know about an event and i would also say i'm gone rambling now but one more mm-hmm. is the first time i visited auschwitz you think you know everything yeah. about the holocaust and then when you stand there and someone tells you and takes you through it's how it works there you sort of put headphones on you go through you suddenly you get it and it's incredibly powerful and that is storytelling that's yeah. why just telling people the facts doesn't work yeah, exactly. You've got to put faces and people, real human faces, because I what you said about Auschwitz, I haven't been to Auschwitz, but I have been to the French village um that got destroyed um in, in the war. I can't remember the name of it now. We were there a couple of years ago. And it was like you say, it was chilling. You could walk around and have a look at the houses and the state of everything and imagine, you know, what the people were going through at the time. And then when we walked out, we walked out along this tunnel and they're trying to gather all of the um, photographs because I've got the names of every single villager who was murdered and they're, they're trying to gather the photographs and it was when we walked out that was when <laughs> that was when I pretty much felt a bit because I was just like you could that yeah. was when you had the faces together with the names and some of the story and yeah so it's that's why it's so powerful we're storytellers like humans are storytellers that's how yeah. we communicate um, and the bits of science you remember from school was when the teacher cleverly told you a story that reinforced something in science or geography or whatever it is that those little bits that we remember. So I guess yeah. one of the challenges for somebody writing a nonfiction book is to work out what the story it is that they're, they're telling. Yeah. And I get that question a lot. And the answer is actually really, really simple. Go talk to your clients. Go and talk to your clients. Ask them why they found you. In fact, I have a series of questions that I get people to go through and um, their testimonial questions. And um, I can run through them now if you want because yeah. they're the helpful hmm. things to answer. But you start with, um, you know, what 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 pushed you to look for the product that I sell? Um, what was it? What problem did you have? Um, you get that part of the story. Okay, that's great. Um, why did did anything make you did anything make you hesitate before buying? Did you have any um, any objections? Any worries about it? Okay, what did you find once you'd bought the product? What happened for you? Could you tell me your you know, top favorite thing about it or the top most useful thing about it? Could you tell me three more things about it? Uh, would you recommend it to someone else? And is there anything else you'd like to add? And they have to be asked in that order because that's how you draw the story out of people. And it takes them right from the problem that they're having, right at the beginning, the problem that they're having, um, you know, the pain that they were feeling, which is what we're really after, um, and the, the problems that it would cause if you didn't fix it with whatever product you're selling, um, all the way through to, okay, so why, why might you want to not buy this? Maybe you think it's too expensive. Maybe you think you're not going to have time. Time is a big one for writing a book for business owners. Like, oh, I, maybe I haven't got time. Um, and then, okay, so you, you've got my product. What was your favorite thing about it? And that pulls that whole different story and then the the top three other things it's like oh okay maybe there were a few other things as well and that pulls out some stuff that you might not otherwise have known because people's reasons for buying are not always what you think they are um and then you know would you recommend why that pulls out more reasons because when people think of recommending things they think about them in a little bit of a different way from just the benefits of them and then the anything else is super important because as any doctor will tell you um it's that um, it's that moment just before a patient leaves the doctor's office. They say, oh, just one other thing. And that's when the real problem comes out. Right. Um, and it's the same with, with that last question is super important because um, 90% of the time people will say, oh, no, I think I've covered everything except for this like major revelation. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's really useful information. So that's how you pull a story out of your clients. And that's 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 your starting point. Do you find that clients are receptive to a kind of narrative story led version of the book rather than them expecting well, chapter one should be on the production method and chapter two should be on our past clients, et cetera. 
by the time they get to that stage with me, they're totally receptive because I kind of beat it into them from, from a long way out. Um, but yeah, I mean, occasionally people, I, you know, I, I do talk to business owners who are skeptical about it and that's understandable, especially if they're in a more kind of engineering-y, you know, science-y type, type area where traditionally storytelling isn't used as much as it could be. Um, but, you know, it just, it just takes a bit of education, a few conversations. I ask them how they ended up buying a certain something, you know, how, how they live their lives. And once you relate the way somebody lives their life to the way you want to write a story about them, they, they get it. It's like, oh, okay, so yeah, maybe I, maybe I didn't quite buy that car or that thing just because it gets me from A to B. Actually, I really like the Jaguar brand or whatever brand, you know, other brands are available, yeah. <laughs> whatever brand it is that you, you want to buy. It's not really about getting from A to B. It's about how does this reflect what kind of a person I am? And I guess they need to understand that the reason people make buying choices is not because it's got a 4.2 liter engine or it's got uh, a great MPG or they do a, a nice color. It is something emotional usually, isn't it? Full, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, the the kind of the stats, the you know the engine size and the paint color and all the rest of it. That's what you justify it to yourself with afterwards, because the way our brains work, um, this this you know the, the way we think about things, the way we make decisions. Decision making is made on an emotional basis. It's like, oh, I really want this thing, or I really need this thing, and afterwards our brains will retro justify it almost yeah. it's like, oh i chose it because of xyz but it's like no you chose it because you you know a jaguar is going to make you look swish you know if you're being totally honest about it yeah uh, do you find i mean in a in a good company a well-run company i'm sure jaguar land rover by the way are a very well run company a lot of this feeds back into the product so you talk about the 4.2 liter, you know i mentioned the 4.2 liter engine the green color but a lot of these things that they offer with the product completely blend into the brand the value the emotional so they don't do something that would be against brand they don't do something you know the product itself is informed by people's emotional understanding of it absolutely yeah and it's, it's a whole experience it's not like you say it's not just the product it's the whole experience of it when you go and buy like a top range Aston Martin or a top range Jag you kind of expect to get a glass of bubbles or something when you arrive you expect to be treated really nicely whereas if I, I'm a Land Rover girl myself if I was going to go and buy a Land Rover um you know, you kind of expect everything to be a bit grubby. You're like, oh, you're right, mate. Kind of, mm. you know, that kind of thing. Mug tea. Um, and yeah, mug, mug a builder's tea, that kind of thing. And, I, you know, I expect my Land Rover to be able to drag, you know, drag a sheep shelter up the road and, and all the rest of it. So there's, there's, there's a totally different experience for each type of client. And you wouldn't mix that. You wouldn't, you would never yeah. talk to a, a Jaguar client about, oh, yeah, you can whack your sheep shelter on the top and drive it up the road because they ain't yeah. going to do that. So <laughs> Yeah. Uh, fascinating. So, so. Are you we talking here about, I mean, you're talking, we talked a little bit about commissions from companies and, and, and how you started. A lot of people will be listening to this who have a nonfiction business. So they offer online courses or uh, coaching or something. And this is an important part of it. And, and I think that a lot of people probably are just thinking it's a glorified business card or I've got to do the book at some point. Well, you're elevating this to something that potentially is of great value in its own right, potentially commercial value in its own right. Yeah, I mean, I always say to my clients, don't expect to make a bazillion quid off the book itself, because that's not the point. It's the back end. Um, so in that sense, it is a lead magnet. And it is, you know, important for, you know, I, I give people my book, I don't have business cards, I give people a copy of my book instead. So quite often, I will give it away for free. Um, but yeah, I, I do kind of object. <laughs> it's like you know what the people who people who do the the template book things good for them I'm not I'm not knocking what they do I think books are better than that and I think business owners are better than that I think they can be more than just the lead magnet more than just the glorified business card I think they can genuinely change people's lives I've I've read like I'll go back to James Clear's book again that that book has materially changed my life you know my, my life is better for having read it and applied the stuff that he talks about in it um I've had people tell me the same thing and and that's you know I've had people reduce me to tears because they've said that they've read stuff that I've written and and I'm sure that loads of people listening to this podcast have whether they're fiction or non-fiction writers because fiction writers have the same effect and so I think that a book should be more than that you know I think it is I think we are better than that I think we can do more with a book than just a glorified business card. I expect, I was told a long, long time ago that don't expect people to read your book. It's, it's a lead magnet. It's a business card. And I remember thinking at the time, I'm better than that. You know, I can, I can, I want to write something that's going to make a real difference in people's lives. I want to write something that they are going to read and act on and their lives will be measurably better for it afterwards. And that's always been my measure of I don't know, quality, I guess, um, with everything that I write for myself and for my clients and everything that I teach people to write as well. I think that we have the power to make a real difference in people's lives. And certainly, you know, there's been no more important time to do that than now. 
And you don't think people should be afraid of pouring everything they know into a book, particularly no, if, if they're doing their one-to-one -one coaching or they've got an online course, they are going to have that, that fear that they're giving too much away. Yeah. And it's totally understandable. And it's, it comes from, it comes from that, that, that fear mindset. It comes from that scarcity mindset that there isn't enough to go around. And there is, even at times like this, there is more than enough to go around. There is, the pie is plenty big enough for everybody. Yeah, the pies are, are sold out, unfortunately. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got panic well, buying at the moment. Hopefully the idiots will stop doing that soon. I don't know. I was, I, I'm vegetarian. I was down the vegan aisle the other day and there's loads of vegan food. So uh, I was. I we'll all be vegan by the end of this week. But so, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, there is enough for everything. So there is always a tiny, tiny proportion of people who are going to read a book, act on it, do everything and get massive results. And, and that's great. That proportion of people is tiny. Um, everybody else is going to read the book, think that sounds fantastic. I need more help to do that. Yeah. And so they will then go and a proportion of them will buy your course, um, your online course that you've got, or they will get in touch with you for coaching. And an even a smaller proportion will get in touch and say, can you do it all for me? And they'll mm. pay top top dollar for that. So it's it's a great it's just a great way to get into people's worlds. It will do all of that heavy lifting for you. You don't have to market your business. You just market the book, and the book does the marketing for you because it allows. If you think about where you read books, you know where do you read? I read books in the bath. You know you you've got no clothes on. You're in the bath, and it's like oh, it doesn't get much more intimate than that. Um, so they're kind of re hearing your voice in their head, especially if you do a podcast or something, especially if you have an audio book. They're getting to know you. They're getting all of this fabulous information. They are. And they're getting to trust you and like you. I have people talk to me about stuff that I've revealed in books and things. And mm. I'm like, I don't, I don't know you. Quite, and it's like, yeah, quite oh. intimate. Yeah. I bet you get that all the time. Yeah, you must get that all the that, time. Yeah. You feel, I forget it, how many little asides I say about things in my life that people remember. And, uh, yeah. But that's fine. And that's fine. It is. And it's delightful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of relationship that a book allows you to build with yeah. your potential clients. And so by the time they've finished your book, they know they either hate you, which is fine because, you know, you're not going to be for everybody or they love you and they want everything that you can offer them. They want all the help that you can give them. Yeah. Is this a good time to be a nonfiction writer? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, while we're all... I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't know when this is going out, but I'm not going to sit here and say you should do anything because I think there are way too many shoulds being thrown around at the moment. Um, I think everyone, you know, take a moment, breathe, see what's going to happen. But wouldn't it be fantastic if you're a business owner to come out of this with a book written by the mm. end of it that you can that you can get working for you straight away? You know, the only thing left to do by the time all this is done is to, you know, get on your course, <laughs> get the ads, which is brilliant, by the way, get the ads working, <laughs> get the ads working, get the background stuff set up. And you've got a book that's ready to work for you that people are going to be crying out for um, because when everything kicks back up again, people are going to be crying out for help. People kind of wander around. We, we all want to be told what to do, especially in times like this. We all want to be told what to do. We want help and advice. And so if you can write a book that's going to help people make their lives and their businesses better, then for goodness sake, go and write it because, you know, we, we need it. Yeah. Is there a business type for whom the book is not something they should be thinking about? Or should everybody who happens to be listening to this podcast, maybe their partner runs a dumper truck business or something like that. Is there a business that won't benefit from this or, or can every business find a way? I have never come across a business that wouldn't benefit from it. Um, I, I never have. So builders, you know, builders can write about how you can, builders can write about how to do basic DIY stuff for a start yeah. because, you know, there's all sorts of things that you can do at home to prepare for builders. I'm, we're renovating a, a 17th century cottage at the moment. So we're in, nice. in, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's drafty. Um, it's awesome. But yeah, there's all sorts of stuff that, that we have been reading about and learning about, but then we're still getting the experts in to do the stuff that might actually kill us. So, um, you know, there's all of that sort of stuff. There's how to, you know, how to, how to how to how to drive a dumper truck even if you know there are people who are going to be interested in that or how i set up my business or how i run my business is a really good one you know this is the way that builders should work or here's here's a good one if you are in an industry where there are pet hates you know estate agents solicitors builders lawyers <laughs> everyone yeah everybody knows lawyers yeah everybody knows the pet hates write a book about how you know write a book about that write a mm. book about why people hate it and how you can avoid working with somebody who's really going to do your head in and why you're the, you know, the roundabout story is why you're the one to choose. You don't have to say that in so many words, but by the time they've got to the end of your book, you're left thinking, oh, this guy knows exactly what I find so frustrating about your industry. Um, and so I'm going to want to go talk to him about whatever it is that he offers. Mm, how not to hate lawyers. It's probably a good book lawyers. title, isn't it? For, for a good <laughs> yeah. lawyer to write somewhere. Um, 
Yeah, so we have a little writing challenge. Uh, actually, I have to make up a URL on the spot now. So we'll call it um, uh, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 29 day, 29 day, 29 day. So just tell us what the 29 day writing challenge is. Sure. So it's the idea is to build a writing habit for people who aren't necessarily used to writing every day, which is most business owners. Um, and I wanted to come up with something that people would find interesting, fun, challenging. It has to be a challenge. And I wanted them also, by the time they'd finished, not just to have kind of a, a shallow bunch of words that, that could be used for anything. I wanted them to have something that they could actually use. So um, a bunch of the emails, some of the emails are talking about personal stuff. Some of the emails are talking about um, business stuff. Some of the emails are talking about writing stuff. But ultimately, I wanted by the time they'd finished it to have A, built up a habit of writing every day, um, even if only a couple of hundred words. Um, B, to really think about why they do what they do, um, what they're offering to people, how they really help people, and C, have some really useful writing that they could possibly use to start writing their book. So the idea isn't to start writing your book during the challenge, it's to, it's to get used to writing, but also to get used to, I think probably the main thing I wanted to get, get people okay with was uh, having the confidence to be really honest mm -hmm. about stuff, because I think when a lot of people... A lot of business owners, a lot of nonfiction writers, when they sit down to write, they get scared um, and they think, you know, because we're used to, you have to be professional and all the rest of it. And actually, I don't want to use the word authenticity because, you know, it's massively overused, but I'm going to anyway. Um, if you want to sound like a real person, you're going to have to put some of your heart and soul and all of that stuff into it. You don't have to air all your dirty laundry and you absolutely shouldn't. But there's a lot to be said for being honest um, about, you know, about your struggles, about the things you love, about the things you hate, about the thing, things you find really, really difficult. Um, so that's what I wanted to, that's what I wanted to do with that challenge. And so far, all the people who have done it, um, even though they found it uncomfortable in places, I think they've loved it and they've found it really useful. So particularly useful for people starting out trying to find that writing habit or find that the writing habit is a bit of a block for them because it's not there and they're not getting as much done as they want to do this challenge and emerge from that yeah so self-publishing yeah. that's brilliant self publishing forum com forward slash 29 day 29 day good well i've got one more story to tell i know i don't normally go on and on in these interviews but this is a bit of a pet subject of mine because i i was previously reported a long time when i left that i did marketing sort of um pr type broadcast pr that sort of thing for a bit didn't particularly like it, i have to say worked for agencies have i think had similar experience probably the same company um <laughs> as you did uh, but I ended up doing a lot of stuff for a very large German chemical stroke pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of stuff in Africa and they were, I'm not going to name the company because they were difficult people to deal with. I hated dealing with them really. They were sort of locked in their ways. They were generally quite an old male um, company. And it was very difficult to find people receptive to anything that we were doing that we knew would grab people's attention and so on. And I had to give a presentation before uh, to them in Germany, not in German, thank goodness. And I, I thought long and hard about this, trying to explain to them why storytelling, that finding people whose lives have been affected by their products was the way that we should be going forward because that what they wanted effectively was product descriptions and, and so on. So that usual thing. So this is what I, I came up with. And I'm quite pleased with it. I, um, I talked about the guy who, uh, at the very beginning of the talk, I mentioned I showed a picture of this guy and I said, have you heard of uh, Ignaz Semmelweis? Now, he is not very well known, but he's the guy who discovered, and this is incredibly prescient, that you should wash your hands. Yes. He's the guy who discovered you should wash your hands. And I said, it's a really, you know, it's a really interesting uh, guy. And then I left it, did the talk, presentation on why stories count. And then I said to someone in the front row, what was the name of that guy? And of course, they couldn't remember the name of it. I said, well, let me tell you a story. So I then told the story of Ignaz Semmelweis, who worked in Vienna Hospital in the 17th and 18th century around then. And at the back of this hospital, you can go there today, actually, the Vienna Hospital. It's like a big teaching hospital, a bit like Addenbrooke's near Cambridge or University College London. At the back of it, there are two big Victorian buildings or 17th century buildings, and they were the old maternity hospitals. And they had two of them because they used to alternate them for days of the week. So on Monday, it would be this hospital, Tuesday, that hospital. So if you turned up to be admitted to have a have a baby in the uh, 19th century there you go went into that one on monday that one on tuesday and i think one of them did two days a week so it was always the same now a strange thing was that the women of vienna knew long before the doctors in the hospital knew that if you went into the monday wednesday and friday hospital you might not come out alive but if you went into the other hospital your chances of living were much higher 
uh, to the point where you would have heavily pregnant women crossing their legs and hiding in bushes at midnight desperately not to have try not to have a baby to go into the hospital where people lived and some of us worked at the hospital doing something else and he he became absolutely obsessed with this he wanted to know why it was and he checked everything he checked the staff he checked the routines the procedures he couldn't crack it he could not work out what it was and then one morning he was sat there having almost given up on this task of working out why the death rate was so much higher in one of them and he watched the junior doctors and they came out of one of the hospitals, they disappeared around the corner, they came back and they went into the other hospital. And he'd already spoken to all the junior doctors and he knew that they went to both hospitals and they did exactly the same in both hospitals. And they moved the staff between them as well. So he's again, was puzzled. But then he followed, he went around the corner to see where the junior doctors had gone and he found they'd gone to the morgue. And in the morgue, they had examined the women who died the day before. And they always did this. They always went from that hospital to the morgue and then from the morgue to the other hospital in that moment he worked out they took something on their hands Mm -hmm. now it sounds weird to us especially now but until that point they didn't really know about bacteria they didn't know about germs or viruses and certainly they had a they had an old bloody cloth on the door which they gave a cursory wipe to as they came out and that was that and he'd worked out and he he invented effectively invented soap as well because he found a way of using carbolic on your hands transformed it and if you go to the vienna hospital if you're ever in vienna visit the hospital there's a nice mcdonald's in there you can go through the hospital go to the back of it you'll see those two buildings in the middle of them is a statue of ignis Simmelweis. now when you tell that story and they call him the savior of the women of vienna nobody yeah. forgets his name yeah but if you just say this guy invented hand hygiene it's been and gone so i think by the end of the talk so i was quite pleased with myself i rambled on a bit quite pleased yeah. to try and really demonstrate to people why we tell stories so. It's, yeah, it's a great story, though. <laughs> so I'm going to finish off the interview with, uh, with me be basically being interviewed by you. So, <laughs> so I've hijacked you a little bit. OK, look, no, that's cool. Thank you so much indeed, uh, Vicky. Um, I think the writing challenge is going to be something that a lot of us will benefit from. Um, and a lot of people I don't actually everyone keeps talking about having time on their hands at the moment because we're all confined to home. I've never been busier. <laughs> we suddenly we're having to make changes Same to here. the <laughs> yeah, changes to the company. We have to think about the future. We've got employees and lots of extra things happen in the middle of a crisis. But yeah. uh, I guess there are people who have a nine to five job, may even be furloughed or worst case scenario, being laid off from that. And suddenly they do have time. This is exactly the sort of thing that, uh, that would work well for them at the moment. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Maybe maybe this is an opportunity for them to think about starting up something new, which is, again, you know, writing. That's one thing I found writing a nonfiction book helps you to think and figure out things. And so, yeah, if if you're thinking maybe start something new, maybe I need to change my business from what I'm doing now, then a book is a really good way to get clarity on that. And you have a book, you have a book, I think, that goes along with what you're talking about. I do. Can I wave it? You can wave it in the camera (laughs) and give it a big plug because that's why you're here. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Facts. I have it. Of course I have it. You do? Because I, 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 I sent yes. you a box of goodies, didn't I? Yeah. Um, yeah. How the hell do you write a book? Um, which I came up with that clever, clever title because I, I spent ages, I don't know what to call it. And that's what people say to me. Well, how the hell do you write a book? So I was like, well, oh, perfect. There you go. <laughs> so Vicky, the other thing is I've just worked out who you are because the reason you're on here is because you sent a little package of goodies to us. Now I'm going to put a health warning out here straight away and say, please don't send us packages of goodies, but you got it spot on. Your package arrived. It was, I have to say, the chocolates got nicked by Lucy Dawson. I never saw them. (laughs) Um, But I do have a nice pair of socks and a card (laughs) uh, and a message basically pitching for you to be on the podcast and wanting to tell your story. Now, the reason I mention it is because this is also part of how you should be promoting yourself if you're going to get things right. Not to do this again, because this has been done by Vicky now, but to think of making that human connection between people. Yeah, I got to say, Mark made my day on on the boat because he, because <laughs> he, I, I introduced myself and he was like, oh, "You, you're good," and I was just yeah. like, "Oh, yeah." He was impressed. So, yeah. He was impressed as well. And you started your note to us by saying, "This is not ricin," which uh, <laughs> is a, a, the sort of reassurance you want. But then I thought, ah, she would say that. Even if there well, was I remember, I remember you getting a parcel from uh, was it Stuart I think and you were like oh I don't yeah. know maybe maybe it was maybe <laughs> it's rice yeah. in and so I thought I'd better reassure you before. <laughs> yeah no that's brilliant Vicky thank you so much indeed for for 
putting your head up uh, above the parapet and, uh, and grabbing our attention, which is quite difficult at the moment because you can imagine we do get quite a lot of pictures to uh, to be on this show. Well, thank you for grabbing me by the head and pull, pulling me all the way over the parapet. I'm really, really grateful. <laughs> hey, no, no, it's been great. It's been really useful. And I think we've reinforced something which is really buoying for all of us, which is that storytelling is how humans operate. So people who write books are never going to go out of business. Uh, ultimately, never. we're always going to be reading and telling those stories. So Vicky, thank you so much indeed. I'm going to say stay safe and uh, I hope you have uh, a good and reasonable crisis as we're all going through at the moment and we'll talk to uh, talk to you again sometime the other side of it thank you so much this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer okay there's vicky fraser so um yeah we talked a wide-ranging interview we talked a lot about not good non-fiction books tell stories in the same way that fiction books do, which I think is something easier said than done. I read a lot of non-fiction. I read quite a lot of military history because I'm geeky like that. And the ones who get it right, their books, you can see they are the books that just break through those of us who are interested in, you know, the space shuttle or the Cold War or something. They are more widely read than that. And they are charting well and the ones who simply tell the nuts and bolts of something and there's quite a few authors like that around they appeal to me and a couple of my friends and then that's it there's a big difference with a non-fiction book of of capturing something and going beyond your uh, immediate audience and I think that's hard with non-fiction but um but when it when it works it suddenly becomes books that the wide you know wide range of audience read yeah there's plenty of very well-known examples of what you call narrative non-fiction so looking at um in cold blood Probably the first one, um, certainly um, Trima Capote's um, book from whenever it was, 40s or 50s, would, would be one of those books. And I've just read, um, I'm reading at the moment a couple of books on the Chernobyl disaster that are, are very um, focused on characters, which is you know telling a story through the experiences of a couple of the players in the story. And, and, and they work really well. They're very compelling um, as audiobooks or um, as, as normal normal books. So, yeah, it's, it's a really good technique. Story is, is, you know, story works for everything. Yeah, um, and it's it like I say, if you get it right. I mean, a perfect storm is another uh, example. Was that Darva Sobel? I can't remember who who wrote Perfect Storm. I should remember. Maybe it was Darva Sobel, or maybe she wrote the one about the watch, Harrison's watch, Longitude. I think that was Darva Sobel. So that's another one. So Longitude. So there's the story of a watchmaker, which really who who's that appealing to? Not that many people, and yet. I read it. I don't know if you read it, but I know lots of people who did read it. It's a very well read book. Claire Tomlin writes fantastic biographies. I think she's done, she's definitely done Samuel Pepys, may have done Jane Austen as well, um, and turns them into stories, gripping stories, page turning stories. So the same techniques we talk about in fiction, um, which I think, you know, maybe some nonfiction authors think, well, this doesn't really apply to me, this bit about character development. It really does. Uh, it really does. It's just a slightly different framework in which they're operating. But anyway, I thought it was interesting. Good. Well done. <laughs> Pleased to hear it. <laughs> Good. Uh, well, that was uh, that was Vicky. Well done, Vicky, for getting onto the self-publishing show. We've got uh, a few interviews today. I've been quite busy in the background recording some interviews, and we are going to be talking about uh, a service called. Uh, it's called Prestazon. So and I've recorded an interview this week with the guys behind that. Uh, that's coming up, something that sits on top of uh, uh, your Amazon Ads account and helps you manage it and run it. And you and I are both sort of exper- trialing it at the moment and running with it. And um, I saw, I did say to, um, uh, to Dirk, who I did the interview with, that I found quite quickly that I probably... This will, what it, even if I don't use the automation, the stuff under the bonnet with Prestazon this will probably be the way that I manage my account from now on because it became a very clear way of looking at your campaigns, of organizing it mm. and making making some broad sweeping changes when you need to make that. Underneath that, there's a layer of automation, which is actually quite powerful and exciting, but I'm also slightly timid about that at the moment. Have you started using the automation? Yeah, now and again, some of the accounts, I remember I've got about six different accounts, so some of them are, are being automated at the moment. Um, others, I'm... You, of course, you can look at the suggestions and then decide whether to implement them. But when you've got big accounts like me, it was firing back six or seven thousand suggestions, and you can only do a hundred at a time. So it was taking quite a long time to uh, go through them. But you, you can you can um, automate it. It's it's interesting software, and it does make a lot of things uh, easier. To, you know, looking at all of your search terms across all of your campaigns, rather than going into a campaign and pulling one piece of data back. So it compiles things very nicely. I mean that that probably is worth the cost of of running it just by itself in terms of how long it how long it's that saves me from doing those things. 
Yeah, and we will have an offer for people listening to the self-publishing show on that to get a, a trial period. Uh, so I guess we should do that interview next week because we've been talking about it uh, as a little preview here. Well, I mean, that kind of also depends on uh, whether we have the course ready to go. So we hopefully will. Um, so we have a, a ad called Ads Automation for Authors, which is will, is part of the Ads for Authors course. So that will be added free to everyone's accounts when it's ready. And we think we'll have that ready by the end of the week, don't we, James? We do, yes. That's my job for tomorrow to do all the editing. We've got waiting for one more video uh, in from Kevin, who's been doing those. Good. Right, that's it, Mark. Uh, I will let you go back to your whatever the, whatever you do during the day, and um, I'm going to I'm going to wood stain my planter this evening. That's my <laughs> job for tonight. <laughs> Wee! It's the life I lead. Rock and roll. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, all that's left for me to say is that it's a goodbye from him and a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.